Tonight we will look at the traditions and practices of Easter as Bible detectives and also learn some important fundamental concepts about how to analyze any subject, especially when things are supposedly connected to the worship of God. Since a Berean Bible detective always bases their conclusions on the Word of God, and the Bible has to be the absolute authority on the teachings and practices of the church, like normal, we'll start with the Bible. So our starting point with Easter, since it's supposedly a Christian celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, is what does the Bible say about Easter? The answer to this question, to any serious Bible detective, is that the Bible says absolutely nothing about Easter. In the King James Bible, in Acts 12.4, there is a sad mistranslation that one highly respected Bible scholar even called absurd. The word translated Easter is clearly Passover, and it's associated with the days of unleavened bread in context, just as it was in Ezekiel 45. That's because the days of unleavened bread were so closely intertwined with Passover that they were often called Passover as well. And every Greek lexicon and dictionary I could find defines the word wrongly translated as Easter in the King James translation as correctly meaning Passover in that verse. Even the King James translators rendered this same word correctly 21 times while only falling short once in Acts 12. Only those who claim that the King James translation is alone the inspired word of God and completely infallible will try to defend this clear mistake. While the King James Bible is an excellent translation, neither the King James translators nor the Greek manuscripts would support the recent claims that the translation was perfect and inspired. We can firmly establish that the Greek manuscripts, the Greek lexicons, the Greek dictionaries and nearly all Bible translations completely agree. There is no such thing as Easter in the Bible. There was a resurrection which occurred on the biblical holy day of first fruits, but Easter is never mentioned, recommended, endorsed, suggested, or even hinted at in any way by any received biblical text. So now we can ask, where did Easter come from? That question leads us to a new principle in our Bible Detective series, and that is this. Whenever we have practices, holidays, traditions, customs, teachings, ideas, or any other thing in the church, which we can't find in our Bible, there are several important steps we should take. The first step is to be on the alert. When we hear or see things being done or taught in God's church, but they're not prescribed or described in God's word, alarm bells should start going off in our head. We should start to listen very carefully to make sure we didn't misunderstand something. But if we confirm that unbiblical things are going on, we need to move on to step two. Now, step two is to analyze the origin of the unbiblical teaching or practice. For example, with Easter, we need to find out historically where the word came from. What symbols does it have associated with it? What practices are normally done to celebrate Easter? And how and when did it come to be practiced in the church? This step is very important, and it's actually going to take up most of our time tonight. And we always need to thoroughly study the origin of things we do and test them against Scripture to ensure that we don't fall into idolatry or sin, as Old Testament Israel often did so many times in the past. The next step, once we confirm that something isn't biblical, is to ask God to show us what He thinks of it. The Almighty will often lead us to passages in the Bible that closely parallel the practice or teaching we're dealing with. And through them, he will give us clear guidance to see how he views things. But we must remember 
God's view is what's important, not our view. God has never accepted idol worshippers in all of biblical history unless they repented. And there's nothing that suggests God will ever change his mind on that issue. How God sees things should determine what we do, not how we see them. The next step after asking God to show us his mind on an issue is to always be ready to turn from the things that God hates. God told many people all through the Bible that he detested their various practices, but they refused to turn away from them, and so they were severely judged. Just knowing something is wrong doesn't solve the main issue. We ourselves must turn away from sin to actually be doing God's will in the Spirit. So when we ask God to guide us, we must be ready to act on His answer also and repent. Then, the final step is to be sure we have actually done steps one through four thoroughly before we gently and lovingly condemn any teaching or practice. Notice, we're not condemning people, but teachings and practices. God will be the judge, and we are only responsible to obey Him ourselves and warn people in love if they're believing or practicing a lie. And if we warn someone about some practice or teaching we think that God hates, without properly analyzing the issue, finding out what God thinks, or actually turning from it ourselves, we might become a hypocrite, or wrongfully condemn something that's innocent, or even put down something that God doesn't hate. We have to make sure to do all of these basic steps before actually condemning a practice or teaching that's unbiblical. As we remember those steps, we can answer our Easter question. First, by being on the alert against Easter because it is not found in our Bible. And second, by moving on to step two, as we carefully analyze historical sources to find out the origin of Easter symbols practices, and even its name, to see where it came from. Let's start our research by seeing what happens when we put the word Easter on Google and look at the image results. This will tell us what the most popular search engine associates Easter with. As you can see, bunnies and eggs are the top results, closely followed by green grass, baby chicks, flowers, sunrises, candy, and oh yeah, the occasional cross. And if you look carefully, nearly all the crosses actually have sunrises, eggs, flowers, green grasses, and other Easter symbols associated with them too. Only one or two of the crosses don't have an Easter symbol included with them. So, Really, the common threads that we see running all through the heart of Easter are bunnies, eggs, sunrises, flowers, and spring. And tonight we'll learn why they still prevail as Easter symbols. Amazingly, we'll see, all of these items are actually very closely related to each other once we understand the origins of the word Easter itself. Let's begin by seeing what one of the most respected expository dictionaries ever produced has to say about Easter. Vine's complete expository dictionary says, The term Easter is not of Christian origin. It is another form of Astarte, one of the titles of the Chaldean goddess, the Queen of Heaven. The festival of Pash, or Passover, was a continuation of the Jewish feast. From this Passover, the pagan festival of Easter was quite distinct and was introduced into the apostate Western religion as part of the attempt to adapt pagan festivals to Christianity. So this highly respected resource directly connects Easter to the pagan goddess Astarte, who was known as the Queen of Heaven. That name, the Queen of Heaven, by the way, that Vines connected to Easter, 
is also found in Jeremiah 44. This will begin to tell us what God thinks of Easter. Because the people were worshiping the Queen of Heaven with ritual vows, cakes, offerings, and ceremonies, God severely punished them. This already is enough evidence to see that Easter is not of God, and He hates it. But we'll dig even deeper to make that point even clearer. As we dig down into this rabbit hole that is Easter, the word pagan will come up over and over again in resource after resource. So we should now define what pagan means from the Christian point of view. Basically, to a disciple of Christ, a pagan is a person who follows a religious system that's not in agreement with the Bible. They may believe in many gods, which is called polytheism, like the Romans or the Greeks. Or they may believe in what is called pantheism, essentially that God is in everything and everything is God. Or they may believe in a single God, like us, which is called monotheism, but their God would be a false God, according to the Bible. Also, a pagan may often worship nature or the earth. They might do this by worshiping sun gods and moon gods, for example, as polytheists. Or they may just think that everything is God, like a pantheist does. But both of these paths lead people into worshiping nature and the things that God created, instead of worshiping Yahovah the Creator. By the way, the phrases Mother Earth, Mother Nature, Old Man Winter, and other personifications of nature are rooted in pagan practices and thought. Next, since the Bible and God's commandments are rejected by the pagan, they will often practice sensual and lawless behavior that's in total opposition to God's word and even society's basic standards of morality. For example, throughout history, pagans have been notoriously promiscuous with open sex ceremonies and naked dancing to even human sacrifice. Finally, in the Bible, the word Gentile is most commonly used in the same way that we would use the word pagan today. That's because the Gentiles were people who were not in covenant with God. They didn't know or obey the one true God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so they worshipped false gods and lived lives of lawlessness instead. As you can see, the concept of paganism can mean several different things but it essentially boils down to disobeying the God of the Bible and His Word. So when vines called Easter pagan and mentioned its origins can be traced directly back to Astarte, the so-called Queen of Heaven, it was because she was a non-biblical goddess who's even mentioned in the Bible as a false god called the Queen of Heaven. So it was totally justifiable to call Easter pagan. Now that we understand where we're headed, let's dig a little deeper into the origins of Easter and see how the pagan rituals haven't changed much over the years. Although vines traced Easter back to Astarte, the name Easter more directly is traced to a false goddess named Aostre. She was considered the goddess of spring, and her worship took place around the time of the spring equinox. The very first Sunday, after the spring equinox and the first full moon, is when the Catholic Church and the Emperor Constantine determined Easter should be celebrated in 325 AD at the Council of Nicaea. So the timing of Aostre Sunday, or Easter Sunday if you prefer, is still in perfect agreement with the ancient pagan rituals designed to worship the Anglo-Saxon goddess of spring. Easter, or Aostre, where the word Easter comes from, was known as the goddess of the dawn, as well as the goddess of spring. And that's why the timing of her worship 
was to coincide with the spring equinox when the sun passed over the equator and the days began to lengthen. And because she was associated with the sun so prominently, sunrise worship services were very common also. Easter is a modified version of Ostara, who was the personification of the rising sun and a spring fertility goddess as well. And part of her pagan theology was, she changed her pet bird into an egg-laying rabbit. Now we can begin to see the connection between bunnies, birds, eggs, the sunrise, spring, fertility, and all of the other typical Easter garbage. That's because it's all directly tying back to the pagan spring nature goddesses. Ostara was also famous for giving children colored eggs as gifts. And we see that practice being carried on in most churches today also in the form of Easter egg hunts. The eggs and rabbits were specifically associated with the fertility goddesses since they also represented fertility. Because rabbits have always been notorious at reproducing, they've always been a pagan symbol of sexuality and reproduction. And since eggs are the byproduct of reproduction, they were also associated with birth and fertility. Among many other well-documented resources, Encyclopedia Britannica states that the egg was a symbol of fertility all the way back to the pagan Egyptians and Persians. And Funk and Wagnall's Dictionary of Folklore states that the Easter egg hunt is not just child's play, it is the vestige of an ancient fertility ceremony. The same pagan origins of eggs and Easter go all the way back to Astarte of Babylon that we mentioned earlier, and also to Ishtar from Assyria. And from these pagan goddesses and their later Anglo-Saxon spin-offs of Ostara and Aostre, we have even received the terminology for estrogen and estrus. As you can see, unless you make a concerted effort to avoid and discern what is pagan, it will permeate your life. Since we live in a world that has largely rejected the Word of God, much like Israel lived in during the Old Testament. Paganism hasn't really changed very much over the years either, since the New Standard Encyclopedia points out that eggs, rabbits, and flowers were all pagan fertility symbols. Now we can see why Easter still brings back up all those tainted search results on Google. Even the so-called Easter lily has long been revered by pagans as a symbol of the reproductive organs, as A.J. Dagger points out. But we frequently mix that ancient fertility symbol in with the Lord's cross. And there is no logical connection between the lily and resurrection. The rabbit or hare was a well-documented fertility symbol in many ancient cultures, such as ancient Egypt. And typically, these ancient cultures connected that rabbit with their gods of fertility in some way or another. Obviously, you Hefner was aware of the pagan meaning of the rabbit also. Encyclopedia Britannica also says about traditional hot cross buns that they are traceable to the remotest period of pagan history. They connect this modern custom in the church with Egyptian, Syrian, Babylonian, and Greek practices that directly connect with the worship of Astarte, the Queen of Heaven, who became Easter. Now, Take Vine's Expository Dictionary, which was confirmed by the Encyclopedia Britannica's 11th edition, and look at Jeremiah 7.18. Literally, the practices that cause God to judge Israel are being practiced in Christ's church today. The hot cross bun and the rest of the Easter practices we have seen all clearly trace back to the worship of Astarte, the so-called Queen of Heaven.
in her updated name, Aostre, the fertility goddess of the dawn and the spring. God's people once baked cakes to the queen of heaven and aroused his anger, and today they are practicing the same mistakes. As we saw in our look at Lent, God called the weeping for Tammuz an abomination. While at the same time, he mentions that his people were also worshiping the sun towards the east. Tammuz was considered the son of the queen of heaven, who later became the goddess of the dawn, as we have seen. And she was worshipped as the sun rose in the east. Friends, clearly, God hates these practices. But we can take comfort. In regards to the celebration of Easter, the church is not alone in its observance. Witches still celebrate it also as Aostre, the festival of fertility and spring. It's one of the eight annual festivals of witchcraft, as documented by Jeremy B. Russell. Who do you think is behind witches in the church, both celebrating the same Queen of Heaven with the same rituals at the same time of year? and associating that spiritual idolatry with the cross of Christ. It is clearly our enemy, Satan, the adversary. Anyone can easily read in Funk and Wagnall's encyclopedia the traditions associated with the festival celebrating this false goddess survive in the Easter rabbit, a symbol of fertility, and in the colored eggs, originally painted with bright colors to represent the sunlight of spring, and used in Easter egg rolling contests or given as gifts. And as easy as all of this information is to find, it is equally as easy to learn how all of this paganism became part of the church. That's because the Catholic Church will readily admit they intentionally brought paganism into the church of Jesus Christ, and they even say it with pride. The Catholic world wrote, The church took the pagan philosophy and made it the buckler of faith against the heathen. She took the pagan Roman pantheon, temple of all the gods, and made it sacred to all the martyrs. So it stands to this day. She took the pagan Sunday, and made it the Christian Sunday. She took the pagan Easter and made it the feast we celebrate during this season. Sunday and Easter Day are, if we consider their derivation, much the same. So the Catholic Church will readily admit they brought paganism into the Church of Jesus Christ intentionally. But what does God have to say about that? God said, You shall utterly destroy all the places where the nations which you shall dispossess serve their gods. On the high mountains, and on the hills, and under every green tree. And you shall destroy their altars, break their sacred pillars, and burn their wooden images with fire. You shall cut down the carved images of their gods and destroy their names from that place. You shall not worship the Lord your God with such things. God detests pagan practices. And he tells us never to inquire about how they serve their false gods. And we must never add or take away to what God commanded on how his people are to worship him. Anything that has ever been associated with the worship of false gods is completely and absolutely without question forbidden from being used in the worship of the one true God. The Bible is very clear on this point from cover to cover. We cannot redeem pagan traditions. We must destroy them. And I am not saying this. God is. 
God even said not to mention the names of other gods. Yet Satan has tricked hundreds of thousands of people into not only saying the name of a false goddess every year in God's church, they are associating that filthy pagan name with the holy name of our Lord and God, Jesus Christ. We have seen that step three plainly reveals God hates the incorporation of paganism into his worship and he despises it to the very core of his being. He destroyed Israel for similar things over and over again. And yet, scholar after scholar today will defend the adoption of pagan practices and pagan celebrations while scoffing at the biblical ones prescribed by God. That's because they refuse to do step four while they ignore step three by writing off the Old Testament. As you can see, I have moved on to step five and in love, I am trying to gently warn the professing Christian world that God is not pleased with our compromises in paganism. Those compromises have not always been the case. Encyclopedia Britannica tells us there is no indication of the observance of the Easter festival in the New Testament or in the writings of the Apostolic Fathers. The sanctity of the special times was an idea absent from the mind of the first Christians who continued to observe the Jewish festivals. Though in a new spirit, as commemorations of events, which those festivals had foreshadowed. Thus the Passover, with a new conception added to it of Christ as the true Paschal Lamb, and the first fruits from the dead, continued to be observed. A true Berean would never continue in any pagan practices once they saw these kinds of origins. Because like the early church, they based their worship on the word of God itself and not the worthless traditions they inherited from their fathers, as Peter wrote. The real Christians ignored everything associated with Easter, even though it was clearly around them in their time. One source records, before Christ was born, the people living in northern Europe had a goddess called Aostre, the goddess of spring. Every year in the spring, the people had a festival for her. The name of our spring festival, Easter, comes from the name Aostre. So the early Christians who kept the feasts of the Lord ignored and avoided the idolatry of Easter. But sadly, many years later, men who believed that the church replaced Israel wanted to compromise between paganism and Christianity. And some would argue they also wanted power and money as well. So they began to incorporate pagan items like Easter into the true faith that was once and for all delivered to the saints. And the rest is well-documented history. This sad record of defeat is why we now have Easter egg hunts in churches, along with sunrise services, hot cross buns, bunnies, eggs, and every other pagan fertility symbol like the lily. God made rabbits, eggs, spring, lilies, green grass, and the sun, but Satan and his fallen angels have led people into perverting those things into a means of worship for demonic ceremonies that honor false gods all throughout recorded history. Source after source can reveal those pagan connections. So we need to turn from them and make sure never to associate pagan practices into the worship of the one true God. God has prescribed very specific days and times for worship, and they have never been replaced, superseded, or outdone. 
if we stick to His prescription, as we see Jesus, the apostles, and the New Testament church did, we'll never end up in the paganism that so many others have stumbled into over the years. We have the Bible and the Holy Spirit to guide us, and that is all we need to worship God acceptably in spirit and in truth. I pray that this message will cause many to pick up at whatever step they've left off last with with God. They can give God the worship He desires and deserves. Friends, Jesus did not die so we could live like pagans. He died so we could be partakers in the covenants and the promises of Israel. The Spirit is saying to the church, My beloved, flee from idolatry. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord in the cup of demons. Jesus is returning soon. We don't want to be asleep in idolatry and paganism when he comes. His sheep want to be fresh, white, clean, and totally ready for their beloved Lord, fully washed in his blood, while keeping the feast with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. <laughs>